throughout this Easter season, I have been reflecting on the various passages that uh, tell us a little bit more about what resurrection means for us as Christians who look to and follow a living God we find in Christ. This new life that is talked about in the gospel, what is that? What substance? What does it mean for us? How are we to act and behave now in this resurrection? So we've explored the different metaphors that Jesus has used. I am the shepherd. I am the gate. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We find in the Gospel of John these various statements that Jesus shares with us. For Jesus wants us to know the vast metaphors that we can use to encounter God, to encounter Christ, and to look for the Holy Spirit, our advocate. In the book of Acts, we hear about this one last final speech that Jesus gives to the disciples before he ascends to God. And Jesus says that with the Holy Spirit, you will be my witnesses in all Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to all the ends of the earth. As I mentioned earlier in our children's message, uh, the UCC has used uh, several scriptures to help uh, create its unity. We call ourselves the United Church of Christ, and we look to the scripture for that basis. The first one being our motto, that they may all be one which we hear in the Gospel of John, which Rose Moore just read for us. I pray that they may all be one. And we use that in uh, the circle that goes around our UCC logo. Well, our logo also represents the scripture that we find here in Acts. We have the cross, which rep represents Christ, and then above it is the crown of victory, a crown which uh, you don't see it here, but in 3D, there's, there's multiple crosses and crowns, so you can see it from all different sides. And this represents that for all who look to the cross that we see in Christ, God's victory over death, over all that uh, prevails against us. And then we have the globe down here at the bottom, and there are three sections to this globe. And we take this from the scripture in Acts, where it references Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that represents the whole globe that encases uh, those three parts of the world that Jesus talks about. Well, what is it that we are witnessing to? Jesus says that you will be my witnesses to all these places in the world, and then, phew, it's that easy. And the disciples there are like, all right, that was a great speech. What do we do now? Well, we hear that they travel. They go back to the upper room. And there, along with others that gather with them, they break bread together, they pray, they become the church that Jesus has asked them to become. I love that they turn to prayer. I think that when we encounter something that is awe-inspiring, that is awesome, that invokes in us aweness, that we turn to something that helps us rationalize and make sense of that which doesn't make sense. Jesus coming here for just a little bit of time and then ascending. Why not just stick around and, and be with us as always? Well, the disciples turned to prayer as a way to encounter a loving God. And we see that Jesus does this as well. At the end of Jesus' life, in the Gospel of John, just before he is taken up by the Roman authorities, before he goes to the Gar Garden of Gethsemane, he prays. And this chapter here, chapter 17 in John, is a really long prayer in which Jesus lifts up so many beautiful things to God. 
Jesus, first of all, says that, God, this is eternal life. That they who come to believe in you may know you. And that they may know me. And in the past couple of weeks, I've spent some time talking about what it is to know God. Who is God? What is it that God does for us? How it is that Jesus, as the shepherd of the gate, opens up this faith for us to be a people who love one another with all our heart, souls, and minds, and love God in the same manner, and our neighbors. But this is the core of what Christ is trying to help us understand about resurrection and new life. Jesus also says that I am the word that has been given to the people. And God, you have given this word to me that I might give it to them. I think that when we turn to the words that help us construct new life and resurrection, um, we become closer to God. We become people with kind and compassionate hearts. I think the words that we use transform us. I was watching a uh, program with our uh, adult education group on Wednesday. Uh, we've been watching a series of TED Talks, and we heard Karen Armstrong speak. Um, Karen Armstrong is a writer and uh, English professor who has gone on to be one of the most prolific speakers around the globe, around uh, Christian, Islamic, and Jewish history. She speaks in this video that we watched about the key to compassion. She says that all of the world's faith traditions have one thing in common, and that is that they say in one way or another that we are to do unto each other that which we wish to have done to us. We call this the golden rule. We call this, perhaps, in Christ's words, the greatest commandment love one another, just as we love ourselves. All the world religions have this in common. And whatever we might believe about those faith traditions and our own tradition, if we turn to that one core value, to be kind to one another, to treat each other as we would wish to be treated, then we might be going about living into this resurrection. And indeed, that's how Christ wraps up his prayer. He says, God, I ask that this may happen so that we may all be one. I think prayer is a way that we engage the words that help us be compassionate with one another. Prayer is a way in which we make sense of this world when it seems senseless. When on a Friday afternoon on the way home from work in Seattle, Two young teenage Muslim women were verbally assaulted by a man, and three strangers intervened with their words of compassion to stop the violence of this world. Two of them were killed, and one of them was severely injured. That those three heroes gave their lives for greater mercy and justice in this world for greater compassion. They took what was in their hearts and they used their words to stand up to hatred and evil and violence in the world. And sadly, they lost their lives because of it. And yet, I believe truly in my heart that they gained their lives far beyond whatever uh, this act that this man who was attacking verbally, these young women on the train, whatever he was trying to do with his words, he ultimately failed. You see, compassion is a way in which we engage the world to do God's justice, to love one another. Compassion is how we reach out to another person and give to them the love of God. I was reflecting about the way that Karen Armstrong framed compassion for me in this uh, TED Talk video that we were watching. And it struck me that if we use compassion, we must understand that compassion is the ability to love another person 
to resonate with them, to understand what is going on with them, and not judge them for it. You see, if we use judgment, then we are unable to enter into a space of compassion. Because judgment requires that we determine what is good and bad, we determine what is right and wrong, we determine all the framework for what is happening. And if we are so concerned about ourselves and our own perception of what is right and wrong, then it is impossible for us to fully hear what is happening with the other person. And so compassion is about setting aside the judgment that we would have for another person and listening into their situation, hearing what it is that they are struggling with. Only then, in that space of vulnerability, can we fully offer to that other person the grace and the love of God. I've been trying to set up this framework over the last couple of weeks of Easter to help us understand that ultimately is not the, it is not the law of God that matters. Rather, it is the grace of God. For God ultimately does this. God sets aside the judgment that God would have, the judgment of the world. And God listens and grants to us ultimate compassion. This is what I believe Jesus ascends into in the book of Acts. And it is hard for the disciples to watch Jesus go from them into the heart of God's compassion, and they begin to wonder about themselves and what are they to do. As they wonder, they meditate, they pray, they engage one another, and they start to become the church. They pray. They begin to understand who it is that they are. There was a moment in my life several years ago where I was struggling with uh, some really heavy stuff that was happening at one of my last locations of ministry, some deaths that I had encountered and grieving families. And I was sad. My, my soul was broken about it for that sense of loss. And I was trying to seek a way to be compassionate with myself. And when I got home one day, I felt this spirit of grace over me, and I, I was compelled to write, to write out this prayer, and I, I turned it into a poem. So I wrap up my sermon today with this poem on compassion. Deep within my soul, deep beneath my skin and bones, there is an ache for no end and feeling and understanding you, O oh God. This ache is born out of the pain my soul has experienced in the depth of depression, in the thought of lovelessness, in the confronting of grief. These things are profound to me, and I want to know if they are profound to you. I leave the office after a long day and get in my car to drive to a different place, to be present in a different time. I move from professional time to transitional time to family time. And in the midst of this travel, I go through spiritual time and liminal time, where I connect to more, more than what is apparentness, what is easiness and busyness. What have I thought about? What has been on my mind and my heart? I listen to the news on the radio in the car, to the voices of the world, yet sometimes it is too much to hear. So I tune to the sounds of otherness. I listen to the car. I listen to the air breeze around the shell that transports me home. I find the radio station with music, songs that are sung to remind us of nostalgia, that transport me further, I delve into my soul and heart, paying attention to my own rhythm. And when I arrive home, I am transformed. I am tired from the journey and hopeful for refreshment. I walk in the door, and I take rest 
with my family, with my life, with my soul settling into the couch, a hot beverage in one hand, hot chocolate, extra whipping toppings, Ashley next to me, extra sweet, Ainsley in my arms. This is life. I am complete. What else is there? What more could grief or lovelessness or depression give to me that I am so taken by them and possessed by their allure? But it is this moment of transformational love that grounds me to my life and gives me strength to shake off the fear and doubts that linger from the day. As the day draws to a close, I reflect, and I know in my soul that I have been attended to, and that you, O oh God, have been with me. My child cries. And my attention turns to her disorientation. On the brink of depression, on the edge of grief, on the cusp of lovelessness. And I lift my voice, I sing her song that she may know that I know. You are strong, my child. You are kind, my child. You are beautiful, my child. You are wise, my child. You are more than enough. Do not be afraid, because I am here with you now. Do not be afraid, for I am with you now. You are strong, strong enough, my child. You are kind, kind enough, my child. You are beautiful, beautiful enough, my child. You are wise, wise enough, my child. You are more, more than enough. Do not be afraid, for I am with you now. Do not be afraid, for I am with you now. And as I finish singing, there are tears that have stained my cheeks. And Ainsley's face is at peace, dreaming, hoping, loving, safe, secure, healed. My song is God's song. My voice of compassion for my daughter is my God's voice of compassion for me. I set my daughter down to rest with prayer and a parent's heart. I smile for the gift this day, and I feel it deep within my soul, deep beneath my skin and bone.